I got a scripture for you that's really good for our time right here. I got this off of a prayer call last night. It's a Clay Nash prayer call. If you go to claynash.org, presidential prayer call, it is. there's amazing prophetic intercessors that pray on that call. I'm always so encouraged. And, you know, I'm learning how to pray by listening to these people pray. Gosh, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, claynash.org. They do, now they are, it's like every two weeks, every second Tuesday night, and until uh, a certain time, then right before the elections, we're going to have, um, they're going to do it every week on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. That's that. Now, here's a passage that one of the men read last night. This is so comforting. Listen to me, my people. This is Isaiah 51. First, it starts out that, look to the rock from which you were hewn. Remember that passage into the... Um, Look to Abraham, your father, to Sarah, who bore you. Okay, but in, down in verse 4, Isaiah 51, it says, Listen to me, my people. Give ear to me, O my nation, for law will proceed from me. And I will make my justice rest as a light to the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. And my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait for me. Now, many people think the coastlands are us, us way over here in the West, biblically speaking. And, and this man didn't say that last night, but I just put that in. And on my arm, they will trust. On my arm, they will trust. The coastlands will wait for me. And on my arm, they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke and the earth will grow old like a garment. Those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. Listen to me. You who no righteousness. You people in whose heart is my law, don't fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults, for the moth will eat them up like a garment, the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. That's Isaiah 51, 4 through 8. Good stuff. And they're all saying, you know, we, we just have to stay on the wall and pray. We don't need to be distracted. Don't get distracted by what's going on. Um, keep believing um, the promises of God. God has said, I'm going to save this nation. There are thousands of intercessors praying every day. I'm going to be on another call at 8 this morning. Is there, God has raised, up, raised us up to pray because he's about to move. There's about to be a huge awakening on the earth. Rick Joyner's word, I think I said it the other day, was that there will be civil war. He knew this decades ago. He said the Lord told him there would be a civil war. It's necessary for what he is going to do. He said, but we will win. Now, I don't know what civil war means exactly there, um, but we're, we're kind of in it now. We will win. So we just have to not get distracted by what we see on this level, but have our eyes lifted up to what God is doing. And we have to stay in this word. We have to stay in this word. Okay, so today I'm going to go on with uh, lesson five on um, this uh, battle over the earth or behind the scenes series. So, um, and and I'll just say first off here, you've got to be kind of, uh, ready for a paradigm shift in some of this stuff. You got to be, um, I want you to come with an open mind because it's, some of this is, it's just, it's really, it's kind of shocking at first to us evangelical Christians, but we've got to look at the Word of God um, in the context with which it was written. And in the Hebrew, um, context in the context of the Hebrew language and what it what it meant in those days when this thing was written when these words were written 
you know, I've loved Hebrew, the study of, of words since the late 70s. I took a, uh, some Hebrew lessons from uh, a professor at David Lipscomb back in those days with a few other people. And I had a, I've had a Hebrew Bible and a Hebrew lexicon since those days. Because I love words and I love word study and I love uh, the ancient, the languages. They, so it's no surprise I ended up learning Turkish and, and uh, some Kurdish. Because I, I, I love all that stuff. There's, there's so much richness in the word when you study the word, the uh, real meaning. So I, I introduced yesterday, I said we're going to get into Psalm 82 um, because of the gods um, because of the gods in the congregation that God is addressing in that psalm. Now this is all going to lead us to um, our end result of knowing more about why there is such a contest over the authority that God has given men over the earth. Why that is so fought. And why, and another, another on top of many other reasons, why the land of Israel is so fought over. So um, I'll just say that uh, I started on this quest particular and learned these things from a book that I got a hold of by Michael Heiser. He's a PhD in Semitic languages. He's, he's, a, he's a linguist. It's amazing. I don't agree with all his theology, but, but um, he's got some great insights. It's called The Unseen Realm, his book. Now he developed some theories on the unseen realm because of the, this, this psalm, 82. And uh, part of what he discovered on the subject of these gods uh, of verse 1, because we see it in verse 1, it's connected to the oldest manuscript of another passage in the Hebrew Scriptures, which we'll look at. The existence of this oldest manuscript and its revealing truth showed up in another book I have. It's called the Dead Sea Scrolls, or uh, I forgot the exact name, but it's about the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've had an interest in all of that for a while, um, what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I became a guide not officially, but a guide in the archaeology museum in, in Istanbul while I was there because I, I I found so many, I've told you this before, so many um, cool things in, in that museum that you can teach the Word of God from, you can teach the Hebrew Scriptures from, because it's like, oh, this is the Hittite marine here. Remember the Hittites? David had Uriah the Hittite killed. Um, the Hittites were mercenaries for Israel, blah, blah, blah. It just came alive. So, um, anyway, got to get on. Uh, so, the, the, I also found these truths that Michael Heiser had brought out about uh, the oldest manuscript of a certain passage in the Word was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, in one of the caves in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it reads differently than our English Bible state. It puts a whole new light on that passage. We're going to get there. But first of all, we're going to go to Psalm 82. Jesus quoted this psalm in John 10 when he said, you know, when they were arguing with him about um, that he would, he's made God his father. And Jesus said, I'm going to read it. He said, is it not said, is it not written in your own scriptures? I said you are God's. Is it not written in your law? I said you are God's. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? So Jesus quotes this psalm, Psalm 82. Let's read it, and then I'm going to talk just a little bit about it. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Now, this is the, the uh, New King James I'm reading. He judges among the gods, little g, in English. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. This is God talking to says he judges, he stands in the congregation of the mighty. That word for mighty actually is El, which is a word for God. Um, he judges among the gods. So this is a scene where God is standing among gods and judging them and saying, why are you showing partiality to the wicked? 
And then verse down to verse 5. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. He's talking about the wicked. God is. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of your children, and all of you are children of the Most High. This is God speaking to this congregation of the mighty, which we now know from the Hebrew means gods. Um, I said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now verse 7, but you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. So it looks like to me that this psalm, which was a psalm of Asaph, is Asaph reporting what he is seeing in the spirit. He's seeing God standing among in a congregation of the mighty, which in Hebrew is of the gods. He judges among the gods. Now I'm going to just point out a few things um, before we finish. I'm, I've got a lot of stuff written down here. <clears throat> the the reason why we know that these are not men, because there's lots of theories. Oh, um, sons of God. Well, that has to be us, doesn't it? it you know, God's, he see a prophetic scene of us, of God judging us um, at some point. Others say, well, these are the gods of the nations. Well, this, that's closer. But he says, but you shall die like men. So think about it. Why would God say to a group of men, to the sons of God, us, the redeemed, in this, you know, that the that the psalmist would have seen prophetically in the spirit, he saw a bunch of men standing around the throne and God saying, You shall die like men. That doesn't make any sense if they're already men. So this cannot be these these uh I said you are gods, you are children of the most high. This can't be Human children, I'm submitting to you, and I'm going to show you why <laughs> uh, as we go along. Um, okay, let me see what else I wrote. Um, okay, we also know that these gods have the word of God from that passage in John 10, because Jesus said when he was quoting this psalm, he said, if he said, you are gods, to whom the word of God was spoken, and the scriptures cannot be changed, then why are you upset with me because I say, calling God my Father, and I call myself the Son of God? Okay, so we know about these gods from Jesus' words that they have the word of God. Well, obviously they do because God is speaking to them in this scene in Psalm 82, right? So whoever these gods are, God is speaking to them. They have the word of God. Okay. Now others have said this is the members, these are members of the Trinity. This is God the Father speaking to, you know, if he's speaking to El and to Elohim, which the Hebrew is here, I'll show you. Then it must be the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Well, how could he, how could God the Father be saying that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit have acted wickedly, have acted unjustly to be exact? No, that can't be right. Okay, now, I'll throw one thing in. You can think about this. What about um, the passage in Job 38? Let's read that right quick. Job 38. It's a beautiful passage about um, what happened at the foundation of the earth. It's when God addresses Job. You remember when? the very end, he says, where were you? And I laid the foundation of the earth. Hello. Part of Job's, um, of God's sermon to Job, the very end. He says, where were you? And I laid the foundations of the earth. Job 38, 4. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched out the, who stretched the line upon it? Who laid the cornerstone? Verse 6. Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning star Stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
Who are these sons of God at the foundation of the earth before Adam was created? Okay, so let's think about that. That's enough for today. We're going to go on with uh, Psalm 82 and who are these sons of God? Who are these gods that God stands among in the congregation in Psalm 82? Now, does this apply to the battle over the authority of the earth? Love y'all. See you tomorrow.